Hi everybody, welcome to another edition of Sermon and Song with Blue in the Face. I'm Chris Catalano and I'm going to talk to you about all things love of God until I'm, well, blue in the face. Today's topic, when all else fails. When I was in my college years, after I was done getting my degree in Catholic theology, a voice inside me told me that something was missing. I had a sense that the Lord was calling me to go to music school where I would spend the next seven years working ultimately toward a master's degree in music composition and my teaching certification. But when I think back on it all these years later, while my career in the classroom has been very fulfilling and it was always clearly what I was born to do, my other career in sacred music went through something of an early life crisis and was filled with a lot of doubts. You see, I had a professor for the first three years that I liked very much. And since I had him multiple times in a row, we started to get to know each other pretty well. So we would often talk about music or everyday life things. And since we were both into sacred music, sometimes we would talk about worship. It was there that my doubts about the validity of my ministry in the church really arose. You see, this professor that really had a strong influence on me had a totally different view of what sacred music should be. He believed that only traditional music, such as the old hymn tunes from the 16 and 1700s, should be used in worship. If it wasn't an old style worship tune, he thought it was no good and didn't belong. In fact, I even lent him a recording of a new album from one of my sacred music idols, which was in a contemporary style. And he made it clear after our next class how much he disliked it, calling it trite, sugary, and a host of other non-flattering names. The problem was that I was still young and impressionable. And because he was the professor, I figured he must be right. And I wondered if the music I was writing in this new style of contemporary worship with pianos, guitars, and even drums at times was just emotional pap, as I once heard it called. This whole thing made me so confused. I could clearly see people responding well to what I was doing, but my professor, who had his works performed in concert halls everywhere, was telling me that this style of music didn't belong in worship. Which voice was I supposed to listen to? I actually carried those doubts for years, and it wasn't until I had a conversation one night in the car with my dad that I was able to resolve the doubts. My dad got me to see that my professor was simply ignorant. There was nothing inherently bad about a particular style of music. But if you're going to compose or listen to a style of music, then do it well and at a high level. Dad got me to look at the whole picture. While my professor may have known music, I knew the Holy Spirit. I saw the positive effects of what I was doing and the music I was writing. I saw people move to tears through the music at Mass. I knew worship. I knew God. And while I don't mean to imply in any way that he didn't know God, it didn't mean that I didn't because his view of worship was different than mine. It didn't mean that my professor's voice was right. He may have been the loudest voice in my head, but it didn't mean he was the right voice. We all seem to have people in our lives that we give a certain negative authority to. There are people we allow inside the sacred space of our heads, and we let their voice disrupt the peace in our spirit. Why do we do this? And we don't just do this with one another. We especially do it with God we do it in so many different ways. We're reminded in the Acts of the Apostles of God's own voice saying, what God has made clean, you are not to call profane. In my case, I allow this one voice of my professor to speak louder than the truthful voice of God resonating in my soul. This is the very same thing we do when we won't forgive ourselves long after God has. This pride in us can attempt to one-up God. We think, you may forgive me, God, but I'll never forgive myself. 
And it's this same spiritual stubbornness that destroys the peace that the Lord intends for us. One of my favorite moments in Scripture comes in the Gospel of John. Jesus had been preaching to his disciples about his flesh being the bread of life and the necessity to eat his body and drink his blood. His disciples were having a very difficult time accepting Jesus' words. In fact, it says that many of his disciples left him over this. Then in what must have been a very sad moment, Jesus said to the twelve, Do you also want to leave? Simon Peter answered him, Master, to whom shall we go? You have the words of everlasting life. Peter, with utter clarity, was able to see exactly where the truest voice came from. It came from Jesus. There was no other place to go. Jesus, also called the Word of God, has and actually is the words of eternal life. So I have a question for you. If you're not hearing this message in your life today, then whose voice are you listening to? Think of the many lies we believe about ourselves. The voices in and around us tell us we're not good enough, we're not intelligent enough, we can't do it, we're not wealthy enough, we don't have enough possessions, we're told we're unforgiven, unworthy, unclean, and unloved. And when we live on a steady diet of those cascading voices in our midst, it makes it very difficult to hear the voice of the one whose words are eternal life, Jesus. And sometimes it's not, Lord, to whom shall we go? Rather, it becomes, to what shall we go? We turn places to fill our longing that ultimately leave us more empty than when we started. We turn to old habits of sin. We turn to some of our favorite vices. We may turn to food, drink, sexual lust and excess. And when the day ends, the dishonest voices that we entertained and allowed inside our heads are only amplified louder. Sometimes we become just like those disciples, and we want to leave too. We grumble and complain that Jesus' way is too difficult, and we want to leave. We lose sight of the fact that all along God is watching over us and can see the entire picture, whereas we can only see the immediate road ahead of us in one dimension. Human vision is not the same as God vision, and in our weariness and frustration, at times, we want to leave too. A number of years ago when my son was little, I was in the middle of a serious personal crisis. To make things worse, without going into too much unimportant detail, I was doing everything that was expected of me, while others in this drama were clearly not. One of my aunt's friends sent a word to me from Psalm 37. Don't be worried on account of the wicked. Don't be jealous of those who do wrong. And even though I believed this, I couldn't help feeling a little of that jealousy. It was a piece of that same jealousy that the older brother in the prodigal son story felt. Remember that story from the Gospel of Luke? The younger brother returned home after squandering his entire inheritance. And rather than punish him, the father wanted to celebrate. Then the obedient older brother, Look, all these years I served you and not once did I disobey your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat to feast on with my friends. For when your son returns, who swallowed up your property with prostitutes, for him, you slaughter the fattened calf. Sometimes that's us, right? Isn't it right? So during that time in my life, I was feeling that jealousy on account of the wicked. And then one Saturday morning, I went to the grocery store, and I ran into one of my choir members, good old Grace Judd. She always had a motherly presence about her and had a simple and rather practical wisdom to share. When she asked how I was, I began complaining about always doing the right things and it making no apparent difference. What's the use? Why bother, I said. And then she said something to me that stuck with me to this day. Grace said to me, 
Well, certainly doing the wrong thing is not going to make it any better. And as simple as that was, the words just hit me right between the eyes. So many times we're meant to just stay the course that the Lord has planned out for us. We grumble and complain when those who are doing the wrong thing seem to get rewarded. It can be very disheartening, especially when we see nothing changing in our struggle day after day. But the Lord sees the entire picture, aside from the fact that justice belongs to the Lord alone. Our job is to stay where the Lord calls us to be for as long as that call remains. Because in his love for us and his ability to see the entire picture, we have to trust that staying the course will lead to the greatest blessings to come later. When God reveals the full picture to us, we'll understand why we were called to follow his plan, even when we didn't understand it at the time. Sometimes we're called by God just to stay in faith. A God is not a random God. There's a reason for his plans. Trusting in God will lead us to see more of the picture when it's time for us to see what he has planned for us. The best is still to come, and our patient endurance will give way to deeper blessings when we do things God's way and in his time. For as it says in scripture, but it is written, what eye has not seen and ear has not heard, and what has not entered the human heart, what God has prepared for those who love him. Again, sometimes the Lord calls us to stay and doesn't immediately reveal the answer why. So why stay? In the 1989 classic baseball film, Field of Dreams, the main character, Ray, played by Kevin Cosner, is working on his Iowa farm when he begins hearing voices and then sees a vision prompting him to build a baseball diamond right in the middle of his cornfield. At first, it seems like nothing good is happening as the family builds begin to mount. Without his major crop, paying off his creditors is becoming increasingly difficult for Ray. But eventually, the supernatural magic seems to work as members of the 1919 White Sox appear on Ray's field as ghosts longing for another opportunity at redemption. This was the same team heavily favored to beat the Cincinnati Reds that lost the World Series on purpose after gamblers got involved. In one poignant scene toward the end of the film, the great shoeless Joe Jackson, played by Ray Liotta, is in a pivotal conversation with Ray, who's decided that he wants to leave the confines of the cornfield in order to experience the magic that lies beyond the outfield perimeter. All Joe Jackson will say to Ray is, I think you should stay here, Ray. Ray can't accept this at first and keeps asking, why? In the final analysis, Ray agrees to trust Shoeless Joe, who more than implies that if Ray will just trust him and stay behind, he'll soon see the reason why. Only when he agrees to stay does Ray finally receive the greatest gift of all. The reunification with his father, with whom he had a falling out with years earlier and never got the chance to reconcile with due to his untimely death. This is a perfect illustration of the need to stay when the Lord calls us to. We often see nothing changing, but sometimes, like she was Joe Jackson, the Lord tells us, I think you should stay. When we listen, we come to see the rest of the story in God's perfect time. Most times, God's best plans are very slow to unfold. Often the slow pace we perceive is one of the true earmarks of the presence of divinity. Think of some of the greatest plans that were very slow to unfold. Creation itself is a great example. So is the whole plan of salvation. It would be thousands and thousands of years before Jesus would walk the earth and live and die for us. Yes, most of God's greatest plans seem to be slow to unfold for us. But just because we don't see anything changing immediately doesn't mean that God isn't working on our story. The plan for our salvation was in the works from the very beginning of time, even though it took centuries to unfold. One of my favorite quotes is from the late Wayne Dyer. Infinite patience produces immediate results. 
Simon Peter answered him, Master, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. When we find the grace to echo Peter's response, as Christians, we interpret that to mean you alone have the words of everlasting life. Maybe you've tried everything else. As believers, we come to see that only Christ Jesus has what it takes to fill our bucket. There's something in the human spirit that wants God to fill us. And we seem to have a sense that the person of Christ can actually do this. We see this clearly in the Gospel of John and the Samaritan woman that Jesus meets at the well. She asks him to give her living water so she'll never thirst again. Jesus answered her and said to her, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I shall give will never thirst. The water I shall give will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I may not be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. In fact, we see the human spirit's sense of I know God can fill me time and again in Scripture. Psalm 23, The Lord is my shepherd. There is nothing I shall want. Nothing? I remember wondering about that as a kid. I wanted toys. I wanted to go out and play. I wanted to watch TV. How is God enough? But we come to realize that when we have a relationship with the Lord, it's the ultimate in fullness, the ultimate in an overflowing bucket. And there is nothing of ultimate importance that we really lack. Sometimes we need to hit rock bottom to go up. Don't despair if you know someone or are someone who's in a rock bottom situation. Again, back to Psalm 23, which says, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff comfort me. Notice it doesn't say there will be a dark valley. But when there is, we have the greatest portion. You are with me. The whole Emmanuel, God is with us mystery that we celebrate every Christmas. How many deep sea divers who get into danger are said to die when they're a mere couple of feet from the surface? So stay strong. Stay the course. And finally, of course, speaking of scripture, the ultimate in our being nourished and filled with the Lord is indeed seen back in the whole I am the bread of life discourse in the Gospel of John I mentioned earlier. The same dialogue that many of Jesus' disciples wanted to leave him over. Could we get any more filled than feasting on the body and blood of Jesus at the table of the Lord? Remember Jesus' words in John. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. And the bread that I give is my flesh for the life of the world. So many of the Christian churches today still have a Eucharistic meal as a central part of their worship rites. So it seems when all else fails, we go to God. Maybe God should be our first option. It would sure save us a lot of the in-between heartache. So, Lord, to whom shall we go? Lord, we'll go to you and you alone. Because you not only have the words of everlasting life, you are the word of life. This is a song I recorded on my new album called Lord To Whom Shall We Go? May it amplify the Lord's voice of truth in your heart and strengthen your resolve to stay with God wherever he calls you to be.